I'd like to <coughs> introduce our first speaker. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Matthew Cook. Uh, is a regenerative medicine specialist and the president of BioReset Medical in Campbell, California. He graduated from the University of Washington School of Medicine in 1997 and completed his residency in, an in anesthesiology at the University of California, San Francisco in 2001. Dr. Cook is a board certified anesthesiologist with over 20 years of experience in medical practice. Currently, Dr. Cook is president of California Anesthesiology, I'm sorry, California Anesthesia and medical director of the National Surgery Center in Los Gatos, California. In addition, Dr. Cook sits on the scientific advisory board of several high profile medical companies, including VM Doc, Free Medica, and Vasper Systems. Dr. Cook's early career as an anesthesiologist and medical director of an outpatient surgery center that specializes in sports medicine and orthopedic procedures provided an invaluable training in the skills that are needed to become a leader in the emerging fields of musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging, nerve hydrodissection, and stem cell medicine. Uh, he's going to speak to us on a number of subjects uh, related to regenerative ap applications. Please welcome Dr. Cook. Okay, everybody, well, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, so what my goal uh, for today is to, is to give you a, a broad introduction to my perspective on medicine, I would say. And regenerative medicine is one of those things that we do, but uh, uh, I feel it's fairly grounded in traditional and functional medicine, uh, Eastern medicine. And uh, we do everything from you know, a lot of psychosocial and spiritual work to the, sort of the most technical scientific stuff that's being done in medicine right now, I think. So it's kind of interesting. I, um, my journey was fun. I, uh, I, I thought psychology totally didn't work. And, so I, and, and my father was a psychologist, so I ended up uh, trying to find the field in medicine that was the furthest from psychology where you didn't have to talk to people. <laughs> and so I went into anesthesiology where all the people are asleep. <laughs> um, and, 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 but then with like, you know, whenever you do something like with that sort of intention, it's always going to boomerang on you and you're going to end up as a psychologist, which is what <laughs> happened to me. So it's kinda, it was kind of fun. Um, and in, interestingly, what, what happened is I became an anesthesiologist and my entire experience in anesthesia was in doing ultrasound guided nerve blocks where I would put a part of the body asleep so that um, uh, then I wouldn't have to put the patient asleep. So I ended up actually doing the vast majority of all of the surgery that I did when I was an anesthesiologist with patients who were awake, so I was talking to them all the time. <laughs> and, um, uh, and it was kind of interesting because we had dinner and I was talking to Vern and, the, and these guys and um, when I first when I first got out, I, you kind of, there was this idea that a chance to cut's a chance to cure, and I was in anesthesiology. And so we're, you know, I just, you sort of took a hook, line, and sinker. And the indoctrination took on me briefly. <laughs> but, um, uh, so I was sort of doing that, and then right in my first year in clinical practice, uh, this friend of mine, Sam Wallace, was this great integrative medicine doctor. And I was at my sister's wedding, and I ran into him and, and I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm doing energy medicine. And I was like, what's that? And so he goes, I cure allergies and stuff. And I was like super allergic to mangoes. And he goes, oh, well, I'll cure you before the wedding. And I was like, well, the wedding's in like two hours. He's like, oh, no, I'll cure you. And he did just by doing energy medicine. And it sort of like shook my mind. And I've been trying to resolve that equation, you know, for the last 20 years. And so I started studying energy medicine and did acupuncture and I became a doctor, doctor of medical Qigong and sort of like went all the way down sort of the energetic perspective. And at the same time that I was sort of on this integrative journey, I'm like, like living a super straight life during the day. I was like the most straight person you've ever seen, like doing anesthesia and nerve blocks. 
and uh, talking to people. Now, th this, the interesting sort of thing about that is, is that the nerve blocks that I do, imagine the human body has muscles and then fascia, and then in between the muscles, in the fascia where the, the muscles, uh, in between them is where all the nerves are. Kind of interesting, that's where the meridians are as well. And so I was kind of like marinating in this idea of Chinese medicine and doing nerve blocks all day and sort of watching and kind of guiding people through super sort of difficult and stressful situations. And it's kind of a stressful thing for a practitioner as well, which is kind of, and if you remind me, this is another story. But um, so I was kind of doing this and then all of a sudden, about five years ago, I found out that uh, if you put something regenerative around nerves, you can make peripheral nerve pain go away. And so I kind of, I found out about this and I was like, and, but, but the interesting thing is, is that almost every field, orthopedic surgeons take x-rays, they have something that they do to look at the thing that they work on. But neurologists don't actually, it's kind of interesting, they don't have a way to look at nerves because neurologists never did nerve blocks because they, they weren't trying to block nerves. So they never had like an experience around that. But suddenly about five years ago, everybody started to find out that if you put something regenerative, like, and I'm, I'll just say some things, and I'm gonna go back and talk about them, like uh, products that are, have growth factors from placentas, uh, stem cells, plasma from the blood, dextrose, um, exosomes, which are secretions of stem cells, if you put those things around nerves, a lot of times you can make peripheral nerve pain just go away. And, and, and so this field that is sort of like my field, like didn't exist 10 years ago, uh, because like 20 years ago, I did like one of the first ultrasound guided nerve blocks ever done. Because uh, what we used to do is have a nerve stimulator and go all the way until we touch the nerve and the nerve would start twitching, arm would twitch like this. And then we'd back up a little bit and inject numbing medicine. Now we look and we go in with a needle and we never touch the nerve, but we slowly surround the nerve with fluid. Now, just to go back to the, tie it into the Chinese medicine conversation, really what I do is I work on meridians. But I mean, you can say I'm working on meridians, you can work on fascia, I'm working on nerves. So then that sort of like, I found out that I could do this and then sudden, like I instantaneously got busy and quit doing anesthesia. Uh, and so my tagline is, is that I used to put people to sleep and now I'm trying to wake them up. <laughs> and, and, and so the, the interesting thing is, is that physiologically, nerves send electricity out to a muscle and then cause it to do something. So if a nerve is pinched or blocked or damaged at the level of the spinal cord, then, then that can either cause dysfunction in the nerve's ability to do that, so it could get weak. But, and a lot of times what happens is if it gets uh, pinched, it'll just, uh, uh, there's not enough electrical supply going out. So then the muscle says, I have to maintain stability, so it'll send a symptom, uh, uh, input back that will cause it to go into spasm. And so it's kind of an interesting conversation. So a year ago, I did all the, two years ago now, I did all the injections for the Washington Nationals baseball team for a year. So I flew all over the country and sort of would treat these guys. And it was very interesting because I'm treating like Cy Young pitchers like the day they pitch. And so I learned a lot from that experience. The physiology of like a pro baseball player though is the same physiology as an 85 year old grandma that has nerve pain. They both have the same nerves. And so what we do for them, we do for everyone. Now, the, the sort of um, trip about this is that if you, the typical approach to pain, so if you say typical approach to pain in the knee is to assume, well, you probably have a problem with the joint. Well, it turns out if you take all comers with knee pain, sometimes there's just nerve pain, but there's nothing wrong with the joint. Sometimes, and there's several sort of genres of nerve pain that people can have where they'll have nerve pain, but it's not a problem with the joint. So for example, the, the nerve that 
uh, lifts your leg like this called the femoral nerve. And so it comes out and it goes through a little tunnel and it comes out and then it has these branches and the branches are, are called the saphenous nerve. And then they run under a muscle here called the sartorius and then they go over and they come down and they run along the tibia and then they do sensation down here. And underneath them running along the bone in the same location is another nerve called the obturator nerve. So these are, these are nerves that exist on the inside of the knee and they have communication and cross-linking with each other. It's almost like if you imagine a tree that has roots, those roots could interact. Now what happens is a lot of times people will have muscle spasm or pain or, and, and they can have pinching of those nerves. So that's like one cause of knee pain. Now, what percentage of people that are in their 60s and 70s have some pain there? You know, they're probably like 20 or 30 percent. Like a lot of people have nerve pain there that is sometimes a little bit confused for other pain in the knee. Now sometimes people can have a problem in the joint. Sometimes that can either be inflammatory, and it can be an inflammation of the synovium, it can be bone on bone, there can be pain in the bone marrow on either side, uh, and then there can be uh, too much laxity or tightness in the ligaments that can cause dysfunction in that knee. What I learned kind of from my professional sports sort of experiences is that if a guy is gonna, go, if a pro baseball player is gonna go do something, what's gonna happen is he's gonna go get like the best trainer that you've ever heard of. It's gonna work on him for about an hour before he goes and trains. And so then they're warming up all of their fascia, getting it all going, and then they go out and every day they're track tracking and watching how their kinetic chains are working. And so it just, and just as a sports medicine thing, which is just, it's kind of super interesting. If I have pain on the inside of my leg, the inside of my leg goes like this. And so if I have pain on the inside of the leg, I'll often have pain and spasm that's compensatory. Because if I get pain and spasm on both sides, it'll at least hold me steady. So then what happens is they're working on these guys balancing and optimizing this. As long as my kinetic chains are working good and have none of the problems that I spoke about, I can squat and do whatever I want. If I start to have asymmetric force coming up and I have torque, that torque goes across the knee and causes pain. So then kind of like the entry level to how to begin to think about regenerative medicine is, to sort of step back, look at kinetically how force is moving through the body. It's like in, in the pro, pro athletes always talk about how do you accept ground force? How's ground force coming up so that I can do something? Now, this is exactly the same thing whether you're doing Tai Chi or hitting a baseball or hitting a golf ball or doing anything else that we do in sports. And so we try to look at all of that, diagnose nerve pain, diagnose what's going on in the ligaments, tendons, fascia, and the joints, and then, then sort of come up with a diagnosis of what's going on. And the, the trip that's super interesting is why like my job is like not boring at all, is that it's different for every single person. So a lot of people will have one nerve pain and somebody else will have a different it depends on what's going on in the joint. So what we do is we look with an ultrasound and I just, it takes me about five minutes and I just look at every nerve. And so I look at every nerve, I look at, see if there's fluid in the joint, I look to see if there's not fluid in the joint. Look at all the ligaments, tendons, and fascia. I look at the cartilage with ultrasound. I have people move around, walk around, and do some athletic moves and sort of some movement analysis. And then that gives me sort of a picture of at a macro sort of level of what's going on. And then you kind of have to be a little bit of a primary care doctor too, because there's all of these sort of interesting conditions that masquerade as other problems. So for example, people with Lyme disease can have joint pain. Now, th they present totally different than pro baseball players and totally different from your grandma who doesn't have any infectious issues. And so then, you kind of have to begin to kind of pay attention at a broader level because a lot of times people will have had 
like an odd presentation and it doesn't quite fit with all of their friends that did great with the same condition. I had a meeting with the chairman of Ortho at Stanford. It's like my favorite meeting I ever had because I was explaining this stuff to him because uh, some VIP patients of mine wanted me to talk to him. <laughs> and I explained this and he, he, he put his pen down and he goes, he goes, you know that like 20 or 30 percent of people that have total joint replacement have pain. I've never known why they have pain. And I, because I was explaining all of this nerve stuff, I go, this is why. He goes, I think you're right. Do you want to do a study? <laughs> and I just haven't had time to do that. But if, if you sort of like keep your eye focused on sort of what's happening in sort of the orthopedic experience, what I'll tell you is, is that over the, this is going to be the the dominant conversation in th over the next sort of 20 or 30 years because what's happening is, is what, like they didn't have, I'm so old, they didn't have ultrasound <laughs> when, I, when I did my residency, but now like all the primary care sports medicine and people are sort of getting trained in, in this. So, um, and, and it's just totally fascinating. Now, the, uh, the does there any questions on any of that, by the way? Okay, so, the, oh, yes. Yeah, so, sorry, where was the hand? Okay, good, yeah. And please wait for me to bring you the microphone so that we can get your questions on the recording. What's your experience with small fiber neuropathy? Oh, that is a really, really good question. So the question is, what's my experience with small fiber neuropathy? So this is a difficult question and it's something that I think about every day and I'm, I'm trying to understand this. One, one thing that I'll tell you is, is that... Could you describe what that is? Oh, so, so, um, so we've got nerves that sort of come up and arborize, it's kind of an interesting term, they're arborizing and spreading out, so they come up in a narrow thing in the spinal cord and they spread out, and then they do the same thing where they come down in a narrow and then they spread out and arborize, almost like tree roots. Now then, peripheral nerves can, can end up getting inflamed, and that inflammation is called neuropathy, and then within sort of neuropathy there's a whole bunch of different categories of neuropathy. So there can be some general forms of neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, and the classic one is like diabetics will have a lot. Now of, of nerves, then there's a whole bunch of different type of ner nerves. So there are little small fibers that especially related to pain, and there's bigger fibers that are related to, to motor. Now what I, what I said is, is that you're, as a, a starting point, you kind of got to be a little bit of a general practitioner. My, my experience is, is that uh, I think a real percentage, and it, like maybe 20 or 30, but maybe like more, of people that have small fiber neuropathy actually either have mold infections or Lyme disease or both. And interestingly, uh, and I wasn't going to talk about this, but um, uh, so Lyme disease is an infection that is a tick-borne infection and it can have um, many different manifestations. It's called, it's a, they call it the great masquerader because it's, a, it's caused by a bacteria that lives inside your cells. So it's living inside the cells in your brain, you're crazy. Now syphilis was another uh, bacteria that did the same thing. And so if it's living inside the cells and peripheral nerves, it can cause nerve pain. If it's living inside cells in your heart, it can cause electrical problems. Uh, there's gastrointestinal versions of Lyme disease. And so um, I've had uh, quite a few people that came in that had been worked up high and low at every famous institution you've heard of for small fiber neuropathy. I've, and I've, um, probably 50% of the people that I've seen have ended up having Lyme disease. And so I've started them on Lyme and mold detox sort of protocols. I'm doing therapies for a lot of these people where I'm putting exosomes, uh, placental matrix and other sort of injections where I'm surrounding the, the nerves. With, and I'm Im improving uh, them, but I'm not improving them like I'm improving everyone else. And so this, 
is, and, and now what's happening is I wasn't seeing any of that because I was just kind of getting like more straightforward in, infections. And a friend of mine who's a mentor came to my clinic the other day and he goes, you have a dilemma clinic now because everyone you see has been to see 20 or 30 doctors. So I'm, see, I'm, I'm almost getting one of those every week. And so I, I tell you that I'm gonna have a great answer for that in a year, a much better answer. <laughs> but my, my answer is that we're helping them and it's super interesting and there is a systemic sort of component to that and then a very local component. And so it may be that, and, and I th believe that there may be an infectious component. I believe there's probably an infectious component to a lot of the misunderstood peripheral nerve situations. Um, and uh, everything that I'm doing is helping those, but I, don't have a, I, I haven't decided what, it, what I'm doing is the best. So does that help? Um, now, so then, so then, so regenerative medicine is like interesting, and so I'll kind of maybe this is a good <coughs> point, and 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 so you you hear about stem cells, um, and uh, so there's stem cells that are your own, and then there are some other type of stem cells that are donated stem cells that we treat people with, and then an entire suite of other uh, therapies that are regenerative that, that are used for ligaments, tendons, and fascia, and joints and injections. So like I treat pretty much every nerve and every joint in the body, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, uh, and, but then in addition to that, there are systemic therapies. And so the, hidden within my answer there is, goes to this idea of a systemic approach of regenerative medicine to problems that are of a systemic nature. So back to the answer, because of what do I do for, for um, dementia? And so I spent a year with Bob Alexander doing, who's sort of the most famous adipose stem cell guy in the world, doing cases with him and mentoring from him. And the conversation always was around doing adipose stem cells at that time. And the idea is, is that uh, fat cells have a bunch of stem cells around them. And then imagine if I go biblical on you and we, we're going running around in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights or maybe longer and we're gonna lose a whole bunch of fat. But then when those fat cells go away, some of the stem cells that were attached to them drop into circulation. And so and a stem cell is sort of like a manager cell. Now it's also true that if you're running around in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, some stem cells from your bone marrow might drop into circulation. And so then they're gonna float around and then they're gonna look for inflammation and then when they find that, they're gonna migrate into the area of inflammation. They're gonna modulate that inflammation and in general turn the inflammation off and then begin a process of rebuilding. And so from the, and from the adipose stem cell community, there became this idea that I think is a fantastic idea, which is, is that we'll do local injections, which is sort of an outside in approach that is targeted to put something good in a place that's inflamed, but also that you could put an IV in and give some of those stem cells IV and then they would have a systemic effect of modulating the immune system and then hopefully regenerating the body. Now, that is a conversation that you could say is an orthopedic conversation and then the, you, that is a conversation that you could say is really a peripheral neurology conversation from sort of my perspective. Um, and then, but in parallel to that, there's a regenerative medicine perspective on doing something that has a systemic effect for the entire suite of inflammatory, autoimmune, neurocognitive, neurodegenerative illnesses. And so there's a lot of interest early on in terms of like adipose stem cells. I think that that's evolving towards, um, more towards exosomes and some of the other products. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna sort of start at the bottom, I'm gonna walk you through some of the different regenerative medicine type of products that are out there so you kind of get a, a sense of the lay of the land and then I'll walk you through some case examples and uh, take it from there. Um, so 
Any, any questions on that, by the way? I was just talking to a neighbor of mine, a friend who was a waiter and things, and he's having uh, his ligament problems. Uh -huh. it, it, it showed up in MRI. They wanted to give him steroids. And um, I would think the stem cell would be something that would help heal the ligament. Um, can, do you have like, is there anything he can do locally about oh, stem cells? Okay, so, so this is, that was, that was the perfect question to, to ask at this time in the talk, so it's totally perfect, thank you. <laughs> so then, let me, so I'm gonna walk you through these products the, of, of, of what's out there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you my gripe with my field and then I'm going to say how I think about that and then what I think the solution is. I'm going to tell you what I think is completely wrong. I think my field thinks about this more wrong from a certain perspective than anyone. I'm going to tell you why that is. And then I'll sort of then try to give you my answer. So we'll see how it goes. Um, what we're trying to do in regenerative medicine is, is, is what he asked. Heal a tendon, heal a fascia, heal a nerve heal a joint or a disc or a vertebra or maybe the vasculature or maybe the brain. So I'm think, thinking sort of broadly about, about, about possibility. Now, just if I don't get to it, remember that has to be totally supported by sort of a coherent strategy that supports biochemistry supports physiology. I think the functional medicine approach is very, very uh, sol solid in that category, and so I use that. Um, the, the first sort of comer to the market is this product uh, called PRP. So what happened is we found out that we could stick an uh, IV in and pull some blood out and spin it and concentrate the platelets. And the reason for that is because platelets are floating around in your body, and if you get hit, those platelets release a whole bunch of growth factors that heal you from the trauma that you just inflicted on yourself or got inflicted upon. So we found out that if we took, and took the blood and got those platelets and concentrated them, we could inject them into an uh, injured tendon or an injured joint and it would help. Um, and so it turns out I do that all the time. And I, I even do something where I take those platelets and then I vibrate them to get them to release all their growth factors, and so it's called a PRP lysate. Lysate means just, they just release their growth factors. Um, so then those are two products that are great that uh, have a lot of growth factors and are good. So then, uh, and, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna answer your question, and I'm gonna answer your question with each product that I'm gonna tell you about. So uh, in the neck, there is a disc in the front, two little joints in the back that are called facet joints that connect the vertebra above to the vertebra below, and then the spinal cord in the middle and nerves coming out the side. So then what happens with that is there could be ligamentous laxity or there could be a, a arthritis or inflammation in the facet joints or there could be a problem in the disc or there could be inflammation of the nerves coming out. So then, to back to my answer, the, it, the, the answer depends on who he is. Is he straightforward with no other problems? Does he have this on top of Lyme disease or mold or, or so? But then what, what we'll do is we'll look and then we'll put an ultrasound on and then look at that joint and then take a needle and then put the PRP right in the, the capsule around the, the facet joint. It can go into the disc. It, we can put, uh, uh, I, I, I take the plasma that, that doesn't have a lot of platelets with a little tiny bit of PRP if I was doing this technique, and then hydrodissect and surround all the nerves that go to the arm. I figured out how to do this because I did it like a couple thousand times to, so that I would put pe people's arms asleep so I could do shoulder surgery. That's how I figured this out kind of crazy. But, so that's PRP, PRP lysate. So then you say, well, wait, wait a second, do you have anything better than, than that? 
And so then I say, yeah. So what happens is when a woman has a C-section, she can donate the placenta. So when you donate the placenta, um, the placenta is like a factory of, of growth factors. And so the, pl the blood goes to the placenta, and you think about it, we've been just running around this planet for like a millennia, and you know, maybe malnourished, maybe not, but blood goes to the placenta and just picks up all these growth factors and it goes to the baby. So it's in incredibly nutritive and regenerative. And so they can take and they can take and isolate all those growth factors in some of the matrix of the placenta. And then they make it so there's no stem cells in there, so there's no genetic material, it's just growth factors. And then a matrix that acts like a lattice that holds stuff together. And so the fantastic thing about placental matrix is it's probably like three times as effective as PRP, and it has no flare at all. PRP kind of causes inflammation and a little bit of flare and pain and stuff like that, and, but then a lot of times there's a healing response. Placental matrix is incredibly anti-inflammatory and can kind of calm down, and so we can put placental matrix in that disc, we can put it into the facet joints, we can uh, put, mix it with fluid, and then hydro dissect and put fluid around the nerve. Um, and so then that's, that's a product, I'll say product number two. Uh, and um, probably a third of what I do, if not more, maybe a third to 40% of what I do is with placental matrix. So it's an incredibly regenerative and, uh, and the, the Everybody is sort of trying to say, and it was kind of interesting because like when I first started doing stem cells and I was doing all these adipose stem cells, the idea was is that, God, maybe stem cells have a chance to cure me. Like stem cells is just a sexy topic. Um, in inflammatory situations and inflamed nerves and, and inflamed joints and stuff like that, I think in, there's many, many circumstances where placental matrix is probably more effective than stem cells. And so then that just becomes a data point. And, and it's like, I, uh, I, I, like 50 percent of the time I talk people into like a cheaper product than a stem cell just because it's more, more effective. And, and so it's kind of interesting on that. So then you, you said, let's say we went back to my little biblical story. We were running around for 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. And we, we lost a whole bunch of fat. And so there's these stem cells that are floating around. And they're floating around in the body. And so they're floating around, and, and what they're doing, because we probably twisted our ankle, you know, when we were out running around in the desert, so we've got some tendon problems and, and some inflammation and some injuries that we've got to heal. So the question is, how, wh what do these stem cells do? How do they do their job? And so what they do is they, they go out, and they're looking around for inflammation, and then they, they find it. And when they find it, they go, oh, we got a problem here. So then what they do is they migrate out into that tissue. And so then when they migrate out in the tissue, the, their, their job is to uh, modulate that inflammation and sort of turn that inflammation off uh, and then start a regenerative process of healing that, that tendon or the issue or whatever is going on. And one way that they can do that is that they have the possibility to do asymmetric division and go turn themselves into a tendon, which is kind of amazing, okay? But they're a manager. And I always, I, I get a lot of people from different walks of life, and like I get a lot of general, co general contractors that come to see me, and I always say like, how much drywall do you hang? And they're always like, none. And I go, that's kind of what stem cells are. Stem cells don't do a lot of asymmetric division. What they do is they communicate to other people to do work. And the way that they communicate is that they secrete little nanovesicles that are these little balls that are full of growth factors and then contain a message for other people to go do their work, other people being other cells. And so they'll secrete a little ball of energy and it'll get absorbed by a fibroblast and that fibroblast will go start to heal that tendon. And so the conversation around a stem cell is that a stem cell is a messenger cell. It's a messenger, it's a communicator, and it's, it's, it, 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 it rolled up on a construction site, saw there was a problem, said we need to, 
we, it, you've been doing demolition, which is good, but now let's, let's clean this work site up and, and heal. And so the name of these little nanovesicles is called exosomes. And so exosomes are incredibly anti-inflammatory because their role in the body is to turn inflammation off. And there's a variety of sort of very technical and interesting ways that they're made, but typically they're sort of a manufactured product. Now, the fantastic thing that in my mind, and I promote this a lot, and we're in kind of a gray moment or a gray area from a regulatory perspective, and so it's gonna be interesting to see how this all plays out from a governmental oversight perspective over the next sort of several years. But there's really no, there's no live genetic material in placental matrix. Exosomes don't have genetic material, but they're the things that stem cells do their healing with. And they have some mRNA, so they have some proteins, um, but they're, they, neither of them have stem cells. And so then, uh, in my spectrum of sort of products, I've, this is sort of the mainstay of what I would call regenerative medicine um, uh, that's not stem cells. And so then, exosomes are incredibly anti-inflammatory to nerves. Like, anti-inflammatory to, to the extent that usually if I put exosomes around a nerve, pain will go away faster when I do that than if I use lidocaine. But, which, which is shocking and sort of hard for me to believe until I started doing it all the time. And so, so, then, I'm, so, so then I'm having a conversation that placental matrix is very anti-inflammatory incredible because it hangs out wherever I put it for a couple months. So it's good for rebuilding tissue. Exosomes, if, if your brother had really impingement in the nerves that come out. Now, interestingly, we, I said the same problem that my baseball player has is the same problem that grandma has. And so the trip is, is that a lot of the baseball players, they all get thoracic outlet syndrome because they throw so much that these muscles get too big, scalene muscles. So then that pinches the nerves when they get come out here. They can get pinched again when they come out under the clavicle. They can get bit pinched again when they come under a muscle called subclavius and another muscle called pec minor. So there's like a whole bunch of places where there can be impingement. And, and often a problem is from the summation of two or three or four other problems. So then we can hydrodissect these nerves with exosomes, but I might treat his facets with placental matrix. So, and, uh, and then in addition to that, what happens is sometimes the inflammation is all the way around the spinal cord or in the epidural space. And if there's inflammation there, it's because remember I said it's the, the spine is kind of like, think about a tripod. It's got these two little joints in the back and a disc in the front. Now, if I have dysfunction at a couple of them as force is coming up, there's dysfunction and they can't handle that force, there's gonna be some torque going through. So that can pinch the nerve. Or if the disc is bulging out, that can pinch the nerve. If there's pain from the disc bulging out, the idea is, from my community, the anesthesia pain community, is, oh, let's put some steroids in the epidural space to calm that down. So our sort of, my philosophy and my approach is actually, let's put exosomes in the epidural space. Because our experience is, exosomes really have almost no complications in the epidural space. You can put them intrathecal, you can, which is, around in the fluid around the spinal cord. It's like the most forgiving product that I know of. And so then uh, our approach to, for, for that could be treating anywhere from the epidural space to these little joints, to the big nerves, even to the fascial planes around there. Um, does that make sense? Okay, so then, um, and then finally, I'll walk you, and if you, if you, if you have another spine question, I'll tell you about uh, 
radio frequency ablation, which is kind of like the worst. And if, if anyone has a question about that, I'll, I'll tell you about it. Um, now then within, so we, we've covered sort of everything that is like regenerative medicine products up to but not including stem cells. So then stem cells, uh, a stem cell is like floating around as this kind of manager cell. What happens is, is the stem cells that are in the umbilical cord are, it's kind of like a neutral zone. The, those cells could go back and forth between mom and baby. And so they don't express the protein that's the identity like Matt. And so those cells are cells that we could maybe give to someone else and they would have an anti-inflammatory effect. So there's an entire sort of suite of products that are, either, that are called cord blood stem cells or Wharton's jelly and these, any stem cell that someone gives you that's not your own is one of these products. Now, I use like almost none of these products because what happens is those, those products were um, harvested. Somebody had an uh, elective C-section and donated those cells. Now, I'll just go business on you. There's about four or $500 of profit in every one of those to the stem cell bank. So they do, a, they do the same blood testing for those cells that they do for the blood bank. So they look for HIV, hepatitis, HGLV. There's like eight things. And so the, the, what happens is if that person had Lyme disease, they're not testing for Lyme disease. They're just generally trying to get a sense of that person healthy. And so for, like for this environment, now, but what's happening is a chance to, I said that a chance to cut, like to operate is a chance to cure. There's, the, the, the biggest kind of catastrophe in my mind is, is that across the world there's this idea that a chance, a stem cell is a chance to cure people. I mean, I could just talk to you till I'm blue in the face about all the great, I mean, I could talk to you for days and days and days about stem cells and the great things about them and why I like to use them. However, um, the, the, there's a little bit of hype that's going on and, and, and what happens is most people who are doing a lot of stem cells and especially clinics that are advertising in bulk are not doing any diagnosis. So there's no sort of figuring out what's actually going on. And then you, often there's no targeting of putting it in the right place. So it's super critical sort of to figure that whole thing out. And then there's another conversation around figuring out your feeling on risk. My, my, my biggest, I think, thing that I do is manage risk for people. So managing the risk around sort of like how safe you think the product is. And like there's one company that just had a catastrophe. They had like 10 infections last year. Uh, the, that's never happened in exosomes or placental matrix because the risk from just the process of how those are made is probably three orders of magnitude lower, okay? So um, now, then uh, next category is those same cells. Let's say I had somebody that was a fantastic donor. They're super healthy. We knew all about them. And I said, I want to make a business around this. And so I want to start to grow these stem cells in a lab because I'm going to do that. So you might spend a couple million bucks and then create a stable cell line, grow those cells up, characterize them, and know an extraordinarily large amount about those cells. And then start to treat people with them and see how they do. Now, these are orders of magnitude safer, but they're, they're grown in a lab, which is, means they can be grown in a lab in the United States, but they can't be given in the United States. The FDA doesn't allow that. And so these are cells that are called culture expanded. Now, so that is like in a whole other category of stem cells. So I've got quite a bit of experience and I work with a lab that does this and I take people to Mexico. And so we do <laughs> those type of stem cells in Mexico all the time because you can't do them here. So that next one. And then we talked about the fact that there's stem cells in your belly fat and there's stem cells in your bone marrow. And so those are both great forms of stem cells. The stem cells in the belly fat as we age tend to be pretty good. They tend not to deteriorate as much. Stem cells in bone marrow and people that have inflammatory conditions and 
they've been getting mobilized all the time, and as we age, the quality and numbers of those cells tends to go down. Um, the, and, then, and then finally, there's one other type of stem cell called a mu cell or a V cell or a pluripotent um, uh, stem cell that are in the blood. They're just floating around, and they have the potential to uh, expand and turn into any cell. So they may be the cells that really do what we thought stem cells were going to do. So these are called V cells, and so there's an entire experience around them. <clears throat> and so then that is sort of the scope of like the products of stem cells. Um, and then any of the stem cell products that I mentioned might be good for the back. Uh, what happens is, is there's a lot of clinics that are out promoting stem cells and they're selling a $10,000 product and then taking one cc and then just kind of putting it in and hoping it will help. And I see a lot of people that have been through that and the probability that that was going to help was like 1% baseline if we don't know what's going on because if I don't know what's going on, I can't decide what to do. So, but uh, any one of those products could have a fantastic benefit to helping them. And then even some of those products like stem cells and exosomes that are given IV might have a systemic effect of turning inflammation off. Does that answer that question? Any questions? Because I, th I feel like we, we're... Just a quick question. Just a quick question. It sounds so new that what you're doing uh, not to be offensive. Is this legal? Yeah, yeah. But, but let, me, let, me, let me say, that, so everything that I'm talking to you about is investigational, okay? And so people, you, you can be consented to do something that is investigational and derivative of an off-label, or is derivative of something that's on-label. So everything that I do is exactly like what is done uh, in every operating room in this country in terms, of, in terms of technique and sterility, but I'm just appropriately consenting people to do something off-label. Now, on the exosome uh, and uh, placental matrix front, those are in a gray area, and there's large sort of organizations that are having conversation like this at a scientific level, trying to decide what we think is the best, what the strategy is going to be lobbying the FDA and sort of having a conversation around that. Um, the same products that I'm talking about, the placental matrix, right now in operating rooms all over the country, when they do a, take out a prostate, they're laying, in many cases, my placenta products right on in, uh, the surgical wound where the prostate was. Same thing with hysterectomies, same thing with tendon surgeries. So these are off-label uses. The, uh, the, there's quite a bit of uh, question about what's going to happen with um, the cord blood stem cells, and I'm somewhat skeptical about uh, that over the next couple of years, but I'm sort of watching it closely. And then the culture-expanded stuff you definitely can't do in the States, and that's something that's an overseas product. And then I'll just say the other thing that's kind of probably the most, I buried the lead, but the most interesting thing that uh, we do is you can put an IV in and take 200 cc's of your own blood out and then grow that just like you grow a stem cell. And then when you grow that, you can grow, but focus on only growing killer cells. And killer cells are these cells that fight cancer and they reset your immune system, modulate your immune system, and fight infections. And so, the, but that's a non-US thing also. But it's kind of one of the things that's kind of interesting for these severe autoimmune cases in Lyme. So, but it, it, it's, it's gray, and so I try super hard to go out of my way to appropriately consent people and then, and then get people to understand that the, they're participating in sort of the early version of a scientific process, and then as we figure this out and curate this experience, uh, then we're gonna, like I've done, done probably 20,000 injections under ultrasound with regenerative products. And so as I'm figuring this out and I'm teaching, you know, 
20 or 30 weekends a year. And so then I'm, I'm meeting with other teachers and curating this experience and then, and then it, because it's like a brand new field that's sort of emerging like a baby. Do I understand correctly then uh, non-autologous exosomes are not FDA approved? They're not, they're, they're not anything. So they're not FDA approved or really not FDA approved. If you talk to the companies that are promoting them, the conversation is, is that uh, there's some language in the new guidelines that says that stem cell, that, that cell secretions are approved. But uh, they, there's, there hasn't been any guidance, as far as I'm aware, one way or the other on this. And so we're in a gray, we're in a gray area. And we'll, we'll, I believe from the regulatory perspective that the first thing, and, and, and I think this is borne out over the last sort of month, if you look at sort of what's been coming out of the FDA, that the, the first push is going to be to sort of try to regulate the non-autologous umbilical stem cell products and that there's going to be an effort to push that down and you would be kind of like well I'm kind of against the stifling of, of thought but I think that there is a good logic for that and so then hopefully what happens is in parallel to that research is going to continue and oh so so then so so then it is it's great can you turn on the so, the, so here I am like a month ago, six weeks ago. Huh? Two months ago. I've no, I'm not oriented. I'm oriented to just person, but not time, place. So I'm, I'm, I'm like uh, driving to the airport, and I, I, somebody hooked me up with this kid, and he goes, uh, I heard your podcast. I think you can help me. And so I was like, um, okay. So I started, I'm talking to him and Barb is driving me to San Francisco airport. So I, was, I go, I've got like 45 minutes to talk to you while we go to the airport. So he's got, he goes, I'm in a rollover MBA um, three years ago and I'm paralyzed and I have a C456 fracture and I'm paralyzed and I'm in a wheelchair. And so he kind of goes through the whole thing and, and basically uh, he is, can stand because he has complete spasticity of his muscles. So he can stand like this, but he could only stand with about 50 pounds of support from two people on each side. And so, and like I like kind of telling this story. It's the first time I told it publicly, but it's, so he says, I think you can help me because you started talking about how you fix nerve impingement. And he goes, I have nerve impingement because I'm paralyzed and I can't move and I spend all day in a wheelchair. And it kind of hit me as like a, patients are sort of like, it's like you guys are figuring stuff out. Like we talked about biohacking. It's like you guys are out on the front lines trying to figure stuff out. So he, he diagnoses himself with nerve impingement and he says, I think you can help. And he had had an exosome treatment like a year ago that had helped him, but uh, he was in 24 hours a day, like eight out of 10 burning pain. So it's kind of like, it's, it's almost emotional just to think about what, what that would be like and to be paralyzed. And he'd been a super athletic guy. And so um, I said, well, come out. I said, I've never done this before on somebody that's paralyzed. I have no idea what could happen. It might make you worse. Uh, and, um, and, but we'll, I'll, I'll treat you at my cost and just see what would happen because it's like I'm interested. And so his whole family's in my operating room like watching me. And it was interesting because I stuck the needle in and he had so much spasticity that it bent the needle, like the needle bent like this. Uh, and, and it's because the spinal cord injuries they have spasticity so their muscles are like this. So he couldn't, he was standing and squatting, he couldn't move his arm, and so I did this move where I put uh, fluid around the brachial plexus, and so I, I put um, fluid around the brachial plexus, and I, after numbing it up real good uh, for my second try, and so then he sits there, and he, he starts going like this, and so 
like literally the whole room starts crying. Like I've never seen anything like it. And then this is him like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So now he's doing, he, this is 21 squats. And then I got about, I'm putting together all these videos of the before. So then he did 31 squats last week. So I put exosomes around like every nerve from his head to his toe. And now he's moving and sort of doing all kinds of stuff that he hasn't done. So I can tell you that it's the, like the most exciting thing I've ever sort of thought of being involved in. Um, so it's kind of great. Um, it's just totally amazing. And, and what, you know, it's interesting, like before he was just locked sitting and then to, to see him do it, it's kind of interesting. And I did the same thing for him that I did with pro baseball players. So I went back and forth on either side of the legs and the front and the back and the epidural space and sort of trying to reset all of these areas. Now, uh, any questions about that? Just a quick comment. That is a permanent treatment. That's not a temporary. Well, I have no, so the question is, is that a permanent treatment? I have no idea if, because it's like the first time I've ever done it, but now people are calling me every couple of days with spinal cord injuries like this. So what I can tell you is that he, I did this like two months ago and he's stronger today than he was then. So it's, it's, it's evolving and it's an evolving and, and my biggest sort of, bang for my buck was in peripheral treatments. So my biggest impact was treating these peripheral nerves that have been in spasm and locked in for the last three years. And uh, my mentor is this guy named Tom Clark, who's like the most famous person. He, he, developed, he uh, made up the term hydrodissection, and he's a famous uh, teacher and physician. And he, he, he told me, he said, when, when um, when he first heard Superman said uh, that he was going to walk, he said, I thought that was like absurd. He goes, now I think we're going to start to do it. And interestingly, his injury was up here, but most of my treatments were down here, even though I did do an epidural up here. I got my biggest bang for my buck down here. And so we're beginning to rethink how we think about all this stuff. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stay on kind of this neurology conversation to answer, because at the beginning, before probably this started getting recording, they said, does anybody have um, any questions? And I think, who, who, who was the person that had the, the, the possible diagnosis of dementia? My brother. Your brother, yeah, okay. So I'll tell you, you know, I'm in very sort of closely watching the Dale Bredesen experience around how he's thinking about sort of dementia. And, and the one way of, of having the conversation is to say, let's, let's consider that there might be several different genres of dementia. So there one, could be one that's, they, a lot of people are beginning to say dementia is like diabetes of the brain. So it could be insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, and the diabetes is creating inflammation in the brain. It could be uh, infectious. So it could be that there's Lyme disease and that, that or, or some other uh, mysterious illness that is a subclinical illness that creates maybe some systemic inflammation and, as well as local inflammation. And we know that the bacteria that cause Lyme disease can be in the brain. And so then there's that. And that, that's sort of been debated and sort of, but I feel that that's going to come into the forefront at some point and should be recognized as a valid problem because it's certainly, I've seen a lot of people with this problem. There are, are toxic and, and so I, let's say I, I have all of these different genres, and so I try to work my way through and, and say there's a whole bunch of factors that can cause inflammation in the brain that can cause dysfunction. And so, the, so then the, the natural first thing to, to go back to is, is, well, maybe stem cells can help them. <laughs> uh, now, the, but I think Byrne, I like what Byrne said. Byrne says, well, put, try to put these guys on... Uh, true niagen. And so 
Triniagen is a supplement, and uh, it is the, the, it's a supplement that uh, stands for nicotinamide riboside. And so nicotinamide riboside is a precursor to a, a vitamin called uh, NAD+, plus, uh, which is a, a, a B vitamin. It's vitamin B3. So we get this vitamin, this B3, and it seems to be critical to the cellular machinery all over in the body. And so if I was talking to these guys at dinner, and they, I said, I came up with this idea the other day. They said, they said could you explain biochemistry in a picture? And so I said, biochemistry, if I had a picture of biochemistry, it would be every road, trail, map, and street, and highway in North and South America. So biochemistry is that complex. It's this incredibly immaculate series of enzymatic pathways that are all working on each other. And so then you say, well, in that sort of intricate sort of web of biochemistry, where does NAD work? And it works at every stoplight, traffic light, and overstop of every highway and street in, in America. And so it, it facilitates a whole bunch of reactions to happen. And then it, it also is critical for your mitochondria to work. And then it also is critical for detox reactions. So it's like this super valuable thing that helps us just get all kinds of stuff done in our body, which is great. So you go, okay, good. So I'm just going to go live my life and everything is going to be cool. So then, so then now, I'm, what, I, what, what I feel like I do a lot is I have a conversation here, this derivative of a conversation where there's a rich experience and that we can begin to understand the physiology of a, a vitamin or a stem cell treatment or a, a, something. And so the, the interesting conversation is, is, comes from an addiction, and I'll explain how that makes sense for dementia. So what happens is in a, the NAD levels drop by 90% from the time you're one to the time you're 90. So it may be that just because your brother's getting older, if the levels drop by 90% from 1 to 90, what I can tell you is, is that we all have different biochemistry. And if it drops like this, some people are going to drop a lot quicker than other people. And there's lifestyle issues and all kinds of stuff. But then let's say we all decide to go start having a bunch of drinks every night. And so then what happens is now we've got a bunch of alcohol in our bloodstream, and we've got to get rid of that. And so what happens is we use this this enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, it just breaks it down, and then we're sober, and then we're gonna be great and go have a wonderful day tomorrow. Except, let's say we keep doing that again and again and again and again. Eventually what happens is our NAD levels start to get low, and then I've got a choice of whether to use them in my biochemical machinery, or to make energy in my mitochondria, or in detox. But I can't just permanently stay drunk. So what happens is we just end up, we prioritize to, to, to stay not drunk, we prioritize the detox. And so then as time goes on, NAD levels can really get low. And so one of the things that we do is addiction medicine. And so we'll give people a 10-day IV. And, and NAD is 90% absorbed in the gut, 95 and so it, you can't really get it from supplements, and so we give it as an IV, and we'll restore them, and they're, they'll just like come back to like life. And then every couple months, they'll get like a booster, and then eventually it just gets spread out. But it's shocking where you'll see people just literally come, look like they're dying to coming back to life and acting just kind of like normal citizens. So then what happens is, so, and so, so what, what I take from that conversation is, is that there's a group of people that have an exposure, and that exposure led them to have low NAD, and then treating that NAD helped them. And not only did it help them, but typically in those people, their cravings for alcohol dramatically go down. So then, so you say, okay, that's, that's interesting. So they got reset. I call my company Bio Reset because everything we do is sort of a reset. 
So then I'm sitting here thinking, just like Byrne, it's like, just like my big soul brother over here, thinking, okay, what is going on with dementia? And, and is dementia in part low NAD that could be from alcohol or could be from other toxins or could be from uh, this, uh, the, the Bredesen experience of what, what causes dementia? Could, so then what happened is I started treating people with dementia with NAD and generally what I can tell is it, it improves some people. It doesn't improve all people, and it doesn't the some people that it improves, it doesn't improve them 100%. People, the true niogen uh, is a supplement that's a precursor. Uh, there's experience sort of in the community that that may help. Is there a synergy between them? Probably. Um, would stem cells help him? So we, like, one of the things we'll do is take people to, um, uh, like Mexico for culture expanded stem cells. One of the things we'll do is we'll do exosomes IV because that has a systemic effect of turning down inflammation. But then Bredesen is I think quite coherent in terms of how he's thinking because what he's trying to do is break down every risk factor for dementia and then address that. So if somebody has high blood sugar, then we're gonna have to get them keto and they can't have sugar and uh, if there's a association between gluten because they have leaky gut and there's a relationship between food allergies and autoimmune disease of the brain. So, so the, the conversation around that is extremely nuanced. Your brother is different from my brother, is different from every other person, but there are sort of archetypal patients and archetypal presentations of um, these problems. And the, the solution in my mind to all neurocognitive and neurodegenerative issues is A, super comprehensive workup, try to figure out if there's anything, let's say, quote unquote, in the Bredesen worldview, and then address and treat that at a biochemical and emotional and social and spiritual level. Um, and then in parallel to that, start to deploy regenerative strategies. And, 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 and they would be, I think, I think that exosomes is, should be the centerpiece of that, and I think stem cells could be a follow-up, and these are the type of things that need to be studied. Um, and, and then those could be deployed intrathecally, which is inside the brain. They can be deployed intrathecally right below the brain stem. They could be deployed intrathecally in, in the back, but have a systemic central nervous system effect. Um, so it's interesting, and yeah, hyperbaric oxygen. Um, is another thing. So hyperbaric oxygen is, is, is this, this technique where you, you get into this hard chamber and then they in, increase the pressure. So it's like you're, you, there's the same amount of pressure as if you were diving and you were 30 feet under the water. And so then when uh, that happens, uh, then they have you breathe 100% oxygen. And so because you're at a higher pressure, more oxygen can dissolve into your bloodstream. And so if you look at the concentration of oxygen in your tissues, it starts to slowly rise, and then they hold it at higher tensions over time. And so then they'll do like a series of like 40 treatments, and sometimes even more, uh, as a modality. And so the, the answer to that question is complex, but, but there are a lot of different approaches, and uh, I think that there's hope. And, and, and the diet lifestyle stuff that is the, the centerpiece and the foundation uh, of all of those treatments is, is very attainable for everyone to sort of to embrace. Two questions. So it's, it's easy for you. You didn't have to move. So I... Uh how do I even say this? I, have, I know a number of people, some of which are family members, who are highly resistant and skeptical and all that, who have neuropathy. What would you recommend to somebody who is uh, not probably like one of your clients, but would probably be somebody who's, what, would you, what, what is something you would recommend to somebody who's skeptical, not that, anyway, uh, is something that they could try that would have a decent possible outcome? Okay. so. 
what would you, what would you, how, what, how would you talk to a skeptic on neuropathy? Um, so, so there's, let me, let me say that there's three sort of models of treating neuropathy sort of in, in the world. Um, the traditional medicine, medical model, I would say, is the worst, which is just giving you sort of um, medications that just kind of numb sensation, uh, but, but doesn't really do anything to sort of treat it. Then number, number two, which is, is what I would call the functional neurology chiropractic approach, uh, which is kind of interesting. So what they're doing is, is they're doing like what a sexy term is photobiomodulation, but a simple term is selling these like lights. Like you could go talk to Byrne, he has, has these amazing infrared lights. And the, they'll put the light on the area where the nerves are for like 20 minutes a day. Um, I've seen improvements with those lights. Now what happens is there's a lot of clinics that will sell you like a $10,000 program where you go get a light therapy every day, do some vibration work, which can start to turn on the roots, those nerves. They'll do, um, I, I have something called shockwave therapy, so it's like a little device that sends shockwaves into the feet. Um, there's um, a, a suite of sort of chiropractic uh, physical therapy type of things that is always wrapped around functional medicine wrapped around a diet that's non-inflammatory, wrapped around a diet that's like low sugar, paleo, um, so, sort of so in the genre, okay? Um, that helps a ton of people. Like that in and of itself might help 50% of people get 50% better. Like it's crazy how much just diet and lifestyle and Peripheral nerves are just like the canary in the coal mine, so it's kind of like, it, it, it's, and when you find out, like, like this guy, Paul, was like in like 10 out of 10 pain everywhere in his body below here all day, every day. Now, I haven't fixed it, but it's like 50% better. So then, um, but it's patchy, so it's like, but let's say 50% better. Um, a lot of people with peripheral neuropathy have that. And so then if, but it's like you have to kind of get them to face that because a lot of times I'd still rather just go have some like french fries and like ketchup yeah. than, than change my lifestyle because it's like we're, we're addicted to kind of like, a, like something. It's kind of interesting. But, um, but so those things work and I would like get them to do that. And then I would say that like, the, they should come see me because I'm like super conservative and I've done like thousands of like nerve blocks and the probability that I make them worse is super low and the probability that I help them is like very interesting and I'm having cases where I'm just totally curing that and if I did that, it, if, if I can do it, it's still investigational because I'm figuring it out because it's not the same in classic simple peripheral neuropathy versus the small fiber stuff. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like the conversation of my life. It's, it's what about the people who are resistant to doing all the diet and the lifestyle and all that? What kind of? It's just kind of like, um, you know what the, here's the thing, this is the thing, is trying to figure out how to have a conversation where you don't emotionally trigger people. Th that, that, that's the conversation. Like my mom, uh, I don't think she'll mind me telling the story. I figured out my mom had Hashimoto's thyroiditis and was allergic to gluten like nine years ago. And now th there may be like four or five people in North America that like gluten more than, the croissants more than my mom, but I don't know them, okay. <laughs> and what happened is, and it was like such a, it's like such a good family conversation because like I tried, I found out about this stuff, I was like, I found out about this stuff, I go, oh, my mom, my, my mom has, I was like, I just figured it out. And I was like, oh, I know how to fix you. And then for like, like seven years in a row, then we had like family arguments at Thanksgiving. It's like, <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I mean, it was, it was kind of like that. And so then what happened is I was just kind of got like emotionally calm and 
neutral and just kind of started talking about it like in almost like in this tone of voice and it's like well it is kind of like this but but like you have to feel good about it and I'm kind of talking in this kind of a neutral soft accepting what happens is it's in in medicine there's this like judgment that's kind of coming at patients and it's like so I had to get into this kind of soft and then somehow my mom like was hanging out in my office and then she was like talking to somebody and then she goes I think I'm going to go gluten free <laughs> yeah 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 I mean it's just, they have to come to that idea themselves you know what I mean and so then all of her problems went away and then she's like my endocrinologist said that this couldn't happen. It was just like, you know, so it's kind of, th that is, because we're all biohackers and we're all kind of trying to biohack a little bit for ourselves. I tell everybody, I'm like on, this is, what you're looking at is like a self-funded research project. So I'm doing this research from my family and friends and stuff like that. But so then figuring out how to communicate to them without sort of driving them away is kind of like the secret. We had one more right next to you, so you don't have to move. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have two questions about, I have to pick one. Um, so I'm one of those people with bad knees. Uh-huh. Um, I, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I eat a really clean anti-inflammatory diet, and I think they're probably better than they ever were, but God made me wrong, and flat feet, knock mm -hmm. knees, and the cartilage is just gone. So um, and I've even had surgery to kind of move my kneecap to be more in alignment, like 35 years ago. But there, it's not the cartilage is gone. It's like fibrocartilage. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking all along, all these years, eventually I'm going to have to have artificial knees. But listening to you, it sounds like. Things might regenerate, like you might be able to do, like if it's really an old condition, can you still how stimulate? How much, how much pain are you in, like just walking around town? Oh, on the flats, I'm fine. Oh, how, mu how much pain are you in walking up and down the stairs? Um, I have to be really careful, like going down a steep driveway, because uh -huh. it feels like it's going to pop out or something. Okay, so, so th this, Pinches, is, this yeah. is like a very limited answer to a complex question. Yeah. But the, if you're walking around town and it's not too bad, th what happened, they, what they started, like some of the, a lot of stem cell clinics started, they were like, I'm going to get an MRI before and after on everybody because these people seem to be getting better. So let's, let's get an MRI so that we can document how great we are. Now, what happens is, <coughs> A lot of people, their MRI doesn't change too much, but their inflammation goes away, and all of a sudden their function goes way up. Your function sounds pretty darn good. There may be laxity because of tracking with the patella tracks like this, and if it doesn't track quite right, that, that can cause a little wearing, and that can cause some inflammation of the cartilage, and that can cause breakdown cartilage. So you can look at that with an ultrasound. You can look at the entire knee with an MRI. The, there may be inflammation in the joint. There may be, um, there may not be. And so then the conversation is to sort of begin to look at that. How I feel is like there's, we're in Silicon, it's the Silicon Valley Health Institute. So the Silicon Valley conversation is, is that the speed of the computer chip is doubling every two years. And so, my conversation is, is that the, the quality of the products that I have are twice as good as they were two years ago. And a lot of them are off the shelf, so I can just pull it off and then treat you, and then I can treat you again in another month. And so, and, and, and then, <clears throat> then my message is, is that this is investigational, so it's sort of like you're participating in research and you're doing something, and then we'll track and see how much benefit you get and then how long that lasts and then what, th what that experience is. And then the conversation is, well, can we, could we get you 30% better and then get that to last for three years? Well, if we did that, I'm probably going to have products that are twice as good as they are in, in, in two years that I'm going to start treating with. So, now, so what, what are you doing? Are you re 
regrowing the cartilage, or what is it? You I, would... you, 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 there may be regrowing the cartilage, but I may be he, turning inflammation off in the lining. I'm gonna if the there's a ligament that goes from the edge of the femur over to the patella called the medial patellofemoral ligament. If that's lax, I would treat that. If I did like a simple thing for you and I, it seemed like it was gonna be great and it didn't work, uh, or if you were concerned, I would get an MRI before. If I saw inflammation in the bone marrow, that generally is not gonna be treated very well by putting something into the joint. So then what I would do is I would stick a needle in and take bone marrow out, take that bone marrow and concentrate it. Then I would take a little bone plug out and then stick a little bone plug right where the inflammation is and then put bone marrow right where the inflamed bone marrow is and then seal the whole thing up with a fibrin glue. And, and basically I'm trying to heal the inflamed bone marrow. So it's like now, People weren't doing this like five years ago, but we're, we've done about 24 cases of that with like very good results and disaster cases. So it gives you the idea that the, the field's rapidly evolving, but it, we're, 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 I'm trying to be as honest about how experimental it is. And it was, it'd be like, it, it'd be like if, if I heard somebody had peripheral neuropathy, I'd be just like, you should just have them come talk to me. And, I, I wouldn't even wouldn't even phase me. This stuff is difficult, but but I think our approach is as good as you're going to find. Okay, so what you're saying is it it doesn't really matter if it's been four decades. No, because like we we treat like like I've had like two people in their 80s that like ortho told them you have to have a total shoulder replacement. And, the, and they were in 10 out of 10 pain and just like, and I put ozone in and kind of calmed the joint down and they had big effusions and the effusions are gone and put some placental matrix and the pain is gone. There's no arthritis, there's no cartilage in there. These guys have no cartilage. But they're walking around and just absolutely ecstatic and they're 80, they're 80 they have no pain. They're, 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 so I, I kind of feel like, that's kind of a home run ex experience for them because it's a big thing to go through a shoulder replacement. A lot of people does have a lot of pain. And it's like, it, even my friends, it's like hate to do shoulder replacement. Like nobody likes to do that surgery. So, so it's kind of a, it's, it's evolving, but I, I, I would be super hopeful if I was you. And then I would, and then, and then it's like, it, it's, this is the next frontier in biohacking where you get to sort of take some re responsibility and then kind of just start to participate. And then, and, and, but then, and then even with you, then that it's like, Willie Nelson has this line, this like, if my words don't come through, listen to the melody because my love is in their hiding. So it's like everything that I said then goes back. I've got to start to think about you like you're a pro baseball player. So I got to think about, okay, maybe you're in spasm in, in some nerves and, and muscles, or maybe, and so then maybe we get your kinetic chains working better. And so then all of a sudden, you're putting less torque across that joint. And then maybe we do that while we're sort of resetting. Maybe you're doing some light therapy. Maybe you're doing hyperbaric oxygen. So it's like, and, and, the, and, and what I like to say, this is a good one. What I like to say is that I've got some 80% solutions and some 10% solutions, and I got a bunch of 5% solutions. Now you have to kind of understand what people's revenue model is. I don't really care what you do, but I, I just care that you get better. But what's happening is a lot of people are just promoting a 5% solution as a total solution. And I think that's, from a patient perspective, the biggest, the most confusing thing about trying to navigate this whole thing. Because I go to the conferences and I see the 5% solution and they're acting like it is the 100% solution. And in 5% of those people, of all people, it is a 100% solution. But that's confusing for, for a patient. It's, it's, but I don't know, I hope that helps. Yeah, didn't you think about changing the torque? The what? Changing the torque. Oh. Change. 
You said something, well, we might work on the knee and that would change the torque across the knee. <clears throat> What, what were you so, to? so what, there's what a, treatment specifically that you would do where you were. Oh, to? okay. So, so imagine the m muscles on the inside of the leg and the muscles on the outside of the leg are both in a little bit of spasm. And let's say they're in spasm because the muscles on the inside of the leg, the obturator nerve is a little pinched, and so they have pain and then chronic increased sp spasticity. Everything in medicine is like on a spectrum. Yeah. And so the people, the people that have that are kind of like Paul, but just like they have a one out of 10 or a two, yeah. he's at a 10. Mm -hmm. And then let's say they have some pain out here and then this is in spasm. If the muscles on either side of the knee joint are in spasm, then that cr can create some dysfunction in terms of the yeah. joint and then when I push force up through if it's not perfectly aligned mm -hmm. that's going to create torque and wherever that torque is is going to be the angle where there's pain and what so then exactly do you do oh, I though? Put, What's your so intention? I put um, a needle around that nerve and I hydrodissect it so I put exosomes or oh, okay, something it. around that nerve and reset the nerve pain Okay. And then I do like a whole bunch of like myofascial massage and electrical sort of things to reset the nerves. And then I coach and show you how to move and, and do things w with this reset neurological system. Okay, and then can I just ask, how does ozone compare to hyperbaric as, as far as your experience goes? So, so uh, hyperbaric. So the question is how does ozone compared to hyperbaric, and ozone and hyperbaric are like two totally different conversations. So um, ozone is a therapy that comes from Germany, and what happens is if you create an electrical sort of like reactor and then shine, put oxygen across it, it will create reactive oxygen species, and one of those is O3, which is ozone. Now, O3 tends to be antiviral, antibacterial, antiparasite, and antifungal. So it has a very anti-infectious sort of thing that it does. Um, and, and then when you do that, the vast majority of the stuff that comes off of that is just oxygen. So there's a little bit of ozone. Ozone is actually a little bit of ozone, and then a variety of other reactive oxygen species, but mostly oxygen. Now you can take that and then you can mix that with blood. You can also inject that into joints and then you can also inject that into other places. And that can have a regenerative effect. It's incredibly good at turning inflammation off in joints that have effusions or swollen. And then it's, it's used by naturopaths and sort of integrative doctors as part of the anti-infection milieu. Hyperbaric is a therapy that for a small period of time in multiple doses increases the concentration of oxygen in tissues that normally don't have high concentrations, such as the brain, such as bones, can be very helpful as an adjunctive modality to help in Lyme disease and chronic infections in non-healing wounds. And so, so the, I have, um, they're, they're similar and different, and then you can combine them. I do that. Like, I send a lot of people for hyperbaric oxygen, and Bay Area hyperbarics, I saw Lisa. I, 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 I just saw Lisa, so I, Lisa owns Bay Area hyperbarics. So I, I started talking about it because I saw her. But they're both great modalities. So, and then ask, she's in the green shirt in the back, so you can ask her about hyperbaric, because it's great. They're kind of similar in that they both will actually attack anaerobic bacteria, will they not? Is that a fair thing to say? The, uh, uh, um, ozone will, and I, I, kind of, yeah, let's say yes. Matthew, we had, um, when back in the 80s, I was working with Steamblock, who was probably the first I ever encountered with hyperbaric chamber. Then working with the Raiders and Rams, we actually, found a way to put it into their facility. If you get a spinal injury and you get a hyperbaric ch uh, chamber treatment within the first 
hour of the injury, you can actually avoid damage to the cervical spine. And if you do ozone and DMSO right away, and especially DMSO, within the first hour of any trauma, you will reverse the damage effects of the spinal cord and the nerve. And we, and we did that, if you remember the fellow from Buffalo Bills who had a concussion syndrome when he went paralyzed, they took him immediately into a hyperbaric chamber and he's now back to full function. Read about him. So, so the, I'm super supportive of that. And so then imagine if, imagine if I'm uh, suddenly, from a pressure perspective, 33 feet underneath the water. So there's that much pressure coming onto me. So then what happens is my blood pressure is like 120. So my blood pressure pushes out. My blood still has enough force to get all the way out to the capillaries. But then there's all of this extra pressure that's pressing in, and that extra pressure is pressing in and then helping push to move fluid out of the tissues. Now, if you look at the cervical spine stuff, what's happening is the spinal cord is in the middle of a bony canal. So if I get a whack and I get inflammation, if, if I start to press on that spinal cord very quickly, I can have neurological compl complications. And so then what happens is if I put them in the hyperbaric, then that may help to push some of that f fluid out of that tissue. And it makes room, or it makes more room because it's yeah. a, because if I if if I'm pushing the fluid that's in the capillary spaces back into the vasculature because of that extra pressure, mm -hmm. I'm I'm able to have a relative effect on improving mm -hmm. lymph drainage. And so we're doing we do that with like peripheral edema, but mm -hmm. you can also do that at the spinal cord. And so okay, so we're just about time. Do you want to what before? Is there something you'd like to say to kind of wrap up or in another minute oh, or two? Yeah. Or? So um, as, as, as crazy as everything that I've said is, we're even better at PTSD. Like, I didn't even have a chance to tell you about it. But like, it's just I've been seeing the most devastating assault, PTSD, military experiences that you've ever heard of. Mm -hmm. and. We do, we do something called the stellate ganglion block where we reset fight or flight. We do ketamine where we kind of reset the nervous system. We do NAD. We do medical Qigong. We do all kinds of stuff and sort of everything in between. So if, you, if you're interested in that, it's kind of interesting. But uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you guys, and I hope it was informative. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.